Hey guys, my name is Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, I'm gonna show you how to treat a gunshot wound. First and foremost, I'm just some guy on the internet. Make sure you're doing your own research. This does not constitute formalized medical training. This does not certify you to do anything which means you should always follow local policies, protocols, and procedures. I have also been known to misspeak, so there is a chance that I tell you something wrong in this video, and I just need you to be aware of that, although everything here is true to the best of my knowledge. All right, next up, this is long-form content, so I'm gonna go through everything that I believe is necessary for you to know while treating a gunshot wound. If you want something that's giving you some half-baked 30-second explanation of treating gunshot wounds, you can go to Instagram Reels or TikTok and find that there, but that is not what this video is. With all of that being said, let's get into it. One of the things that differentiates gunshot wounds from other kinds of penetrating trauma is going to be its velocity. So when a high-speed projectile hits the body, it causes something called cavitation. Cavitation is the pressure wave that expands from that projectile that can cause damage to tissues not directly in line with the exit and entrance wound of that bullet. While this doesn't necessarily change your treatment, it is one of the reasons why we can't recommend tampons for bleeding control, because while the hole might look like it's just the size of the bullet, the trauma inside the body can be much bigger and there's simply not enough fabric in that tampon to cause good tamponade of the bleeding. Depending on what kind of situation you will find yourself in, there are different injury patterns you can expect. The big differentiation here is bullet wounds in a military environment versus bullet wounds in a civilian environment. In the military, we have a lot of soldiers wearing bulletproof vests, which means while they do get hit in the same spots that a civilian will if they're shot multiple times, generally speaking, they have armor that's going to protect their thoracic cavity, and we're going to see more massive bleeding from extremities. In the civilian world, we are not usually wearing armor, and we can have a lot more penetrating trauma to the torso and the abdomen. Before we get into part by part and what to do in those very specific situations, let's talk about your general approach to patients. The first thing you need to consider is scene safety. You do not want to get shot with the same gun that just shot the victim you are trying to treat. So you need to make sure that you are mitigating that risk in some form. I will be the first to tell you that no scene is completely safe. You just have to use your best judgment and not become a victim as well. Now, the next thing you're going to do when you approach the patient is you're going to address massive bleeding first. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to basically assume that any body part I'm talking about is going to be the only thing affected. But in all actuality, you will probably have multiple gunshot wounds and have to do a little bit of prioritizing on what you're treating and when. If you haven't watched my March algorithm video, I will leave that link up here. You can check it out at your convenience, but that will kind of help you determine uh, the priority of care going forward for a patient. Once you've addressed your massive bleeding, you're going to come to airway. You're gonna make sure there is a clear line of air from the nose and mouth to the lungs. The next step there is going to be respirations, and that's going to be making sure they're using uh, that clear airway that you just established. Next up, we're going to make sure the patient remains as warm as possible. Even on really hot days, we wanna conserve their body heat because in trauma situations, the body tries to take on the temperature of their environment, and even if it drops down to 95 degrees, that's going to cause issues with coagulation and the body isn't going to be able to compensate as well for the massive blood loss they have experienced. Last but not least, and one of the most important points here is you need to get them to definitive care quickly. Everything we are doing is temporary for these patients. This is not something that is going to make them all better. We are not fixing them. They need a surgeon. We are just giving them the chance to get to the surgeon alive and not bleed out uh, or drown in their own blood in the meantime. So now that we've gone over the general approach, let's get a little bit more specific into body part by body part when it's hit. All right, so the first injury we're going to talk about is bullet holes to the extremities, so the arms and the legs. Now, when you approach somebody, like I just said, your first concern is massive hemorrhage because that's what's going to kill them right now. In an extremity, hemorrhage is really the only thing that's going to kill them in five minutes. We can address broken bones and other orthopedic issues at a later time. So the first thing we're going to look at doing to control extremity bleeding is going to be apply a tourniquet if it is life-threatening. So this is massive bleeding. This is pooling under the patient. This is soaking through multiple layers of clothes, uh, spurting blood coming out of the wound. 
any of those are going to be signs that we need to intervene very fast and we don't have time to go to other measures. There used to be this misconception that if we applied a tourniquet, we would have to amputate the patient's arm at the hospital later. This is blatantly false. Patients can have tourniquets on for upwards of six hours before the risk of losing that limb becomes prevalent. Now, in most parts of the world, we can get somebody to definitive care to have that repaired by a surgeon way under six hours. So you should be pretty quick to apply a tourniquet if you suspect massive life-threatening bleeding. So in front of you, I have a couple options for commercial tourniquets. Here we've got a ratcheting tourniquet, we've got a SAM tourniquet, and then a CAT tourniquet. These are all Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care recommended, and I would recommend going with one of these options just because they've been studied, we know they work, and uh, they're not that expensive, although price tags have gone up in recent months. So with these options, I usually go with the CAT tourniquet, but they're all going to work relatively the same. Now, to demonstrate this, I have this guy right here. Now, I know this is a laceration. We're gonna pretend this doesn't exist here. This is just another wound. So we're gonna say this is a gunshot wound and it's bleeding massively from that. We have an arterial wound. With a tourniquet, we're going to expand it. And this principle goes for pretty much any commercial tourniquet on the market. We're gonna put it uh, three to four inches above that wound. We're gonna avoid any kind of joint. So we don't wanna put it over the knees or the elbows uh, at any time because that's not going to constrict the blood vessel. They used to say high and tight. And if you go and somebody's shot through the leg and they've got long pants on, you can't quite tell where it's bleeding, you can go high and tight. If you're in a situation where you can't really determine where to put this, high and tight. But generally speaking, if you know where the wound is, two to three inches above is where you put it. It doesn't matter if it's around a two bone compartment or a one bone compartment up in the humerus, right above that wound is where we wanna put it. So I'm gonna take this. I'm going to slide the tourniquet up around the leg. Make sure I'm in frame here. And now we're gonna tighten this initial band. Now this band tightening is the most important part of tourniquet application. If this is loose at all, it is not going to function appropriately. So with the cat tourniquet, I'm just going to pull that as tight as humanly possible. And I'm going to just run that tail all the way through to the back of the leg. And I'm gonna kind of let that hang. Next step is to turn the windlass. So the windlass is the rod that actually tensions a tourniquet. So I'm gonna turn this until bleeding stops. Now this is relatively painful. Talk to your patient, make sure they understand what you're doing. Don't just start doing this and not communicating with them. So we're gonna turn this around probably a couple times. That windlass is going to lock into place and now I'm going to take this tail, tuck it in this bracket and throw the time strip over it. We can write the time on here. People like to point out, you can write the time in blood on their head. And that is just to tell the receiving hospital how long this tourniquet has been in place. While you won't lose a limb with under that six hour mark, there is metabolic buildup distal, so under that tourniquet. And if you release this tourniquet, you can shower the body with that metabolic waste and you can cause some cardiac issues. So in the hospital, before this is taken off, they might have to give a cocktail of meds. Which comes to my second point. If you apply this tourniquet, do not take it off until it is evaluated by a medical professional. I do have a video on tourniquet conversions you can check out. Once again, I'll leave the link up here, but that is not something you will generally do uh, as just a lay person rendering aid to somebody. So once a tourniquet's on, it's on. If this initial tourniquet does not work, your first step is going to be to take this time strip back. You can take this guy here and we can tighten this one more time around and see if it stops the bleeding then. If it's still not working, we can take a second tourniquet and put it just above this one, or if there's room between the wound, you can put it just below this one and tighten the second tourniquet. Most of the time, this is not going to be an issue, especially if you have that initial tightening where it should be. A lot of people are gonna talk about improvised tourniquets. Now, we know through quite a lot of data that improvised tourniquets are not very effective, and it's not recommended you go that route if at all possible. So I recommend going to commercial tourniquets here. That's just going to be a lot easier a lot more expedient. There is a time and a place for improvised tourniquets, but that's a little bit out of the scope uh, of this video. Once again, though, I do have a video on improvised medical items that I will leave uh, the link up here for you guys to find at your leisure. So let's say you do not have uh, a tourniquet and you, you don't have one available to you. Somebody in front of you gets shot and you need to do something for them. Let's get this guy out of the way. In this case, 
direct pressure is going to be the hallmark of your care. And we can do this in a couple different ways. So if it is a very superficial wound, uh, generally speaking, we can apply very tight direct pressure over that with a pressure bandage. But if it is cavitated, if we have like a hole going into the body, we can't just cover it up with a pressure bandage because the bleeding's actually happening in that hole. And while the pressure bandage might make it look prettier, it's not actually doing anything to stop the bleeding. And that's where wound packing comes in. We're gonna talk about wound packing a little bit more when we get to junctional site injuries. Just be aware that you can perform the same procedure on an extremity if you have uh, no other options available. These pressure bandages all work relatively similarly. They all have little like devices that can cause like downward pressure and stuff. In general though, we take this pad, we put it to the wound, and then we're just going to wrap it as tight as possible, pushing down uh, on that wound. We need to make sure we're monitoring for continuous bleeding, making sure we don't need to apply a tourniquet. If maybe we put this on uh, because they were bleeding minorly, now it's a little bit more severe. Uh, we also might have to pack the wound. So keep that all in mind with these pressure bandages. So now that we've talked about extremity injuries, let's talk about junctional sites. Junctional sites are the base of the neck, the armpit, and the groin. And all three of these sites have major arteries running through them. They can cause massive bleeding and death quickly if not intervened on. In these cases, we cannot put tourniquets on them just because they are too high up. We can't put a tourniquet around the shoulder. We shouldn't be putting tourniquets around somebody's neck, uh, as funny as that would be periodically. And we can't put uh, tourniquets around somebody's abdomen. So in this case, we're going to have to wound pack. Now we have a couple different options with wound packing. So I've got this uh, trainer right here. So when we're packing the wound, we have three options. The gold standard is going to be quick clot, which is basically a hemostatic agent to help promote clotting that's put in this gauze that can just kind of help do the job. The next option is going to be some kind of compressed gauze. It looks very similar to this, but it doesn't have the agent inside of it. And last but not least, we have t-shirts. We have fabric that's around us. All three are going to work with relatively similar results. Like I said, the gold standards, this is your second option and a shirt or some improvised fabric is going to be next. The key with this is it has to be some kind of really dense fabric. We are not doing tampons, they do not work. We are not doing Kleenex or like little gauze pads. We need a lot of fabric. T-shirts are actually really good because they're really tight knit and you can get that pressure on the artery. The other thing we don't wanna be using is powders. So those were big for a while, but what we found is that what's actually stopping the bleeding while the hemostatic agent helps, we actually need direct pressure on that wound going down to the artery. Now I did another video on this where I was talking about finding the artery in the wound. Basically all finding the artery means is finding where the wound is bleeding most severely from and trying to push pressure onto that site. We're not just packing down into a hole indiscriminately if we can help it. So this is great, this is fine. Uh, and for the demonstration here, this is like $2 and that uh, quick clot is like 50. So I'm gonna be opening this guy, but they work just the same. So we have somebody that's bleeding massively from uh, let's say the groin here, we're going to pack the wound. And like I said, massive bleeding is always our first priority. So in this case, I have this gauze right here. I'm gonna form kind of a ball at the end. I'm going to push it down into the wound, find wherever it's bleeding most heavily from. If we can't find it, we just pack it down as tight as we can. And now I'm going to exchange fingers. So I'm gonna take this finger, I'm gonna replace that one there. And now I'm gonna take it again and I'm just going to go hand over hand and packing this as full as possible. One thing I do not want to do is I don't want to release pressure here. I always wanna be packing down into the wound, maintaining direct pressure the entire time. Now you will see how big this wound cavity actually is here. I've got a lot of gauze going into this where like if you tried to do this with a tampon, uh, you'd have run out a long time ago. This thing would fit probably like 10, 12 tampons in here before you'd actually get any kind of pressure down. So now that we have direct pressure, the key is to maintain that pressure as tight as possible. I don't wanna do really diffuse pressure because that's going to spread it out over a big uh, area where it's bleeding from one site. So we can take this, we can put some gauze up and just really hold that tight. If you're doing this with a hemostatic agent, they say you can hold it for a shorter period of time than you can with 
a non-hemostatic agent. What I will tell you is if you're not in a dangerous situation and you have the strength to continue, hold this until somebody takes that manual pressure directly from you. If you are in a situation where you have to move this patient, somebody's not safe, we're gonna have to get out of there quickly. What we'll do is we'll take a pressure bandage after holding this for as long as possible and we can actually wrap it really tightly into uh, the wound. So when I take this out, you can actually see how much gauze I was actually able to push into that wound. And even though it's a pretty small wound, you can see the cavity inside of it. And this goes into the cavitation concept I was talking about at the beginning of the video. So that's your junctional sites. Next up, let's talk about wounds to your thorax. So this is going to be wounds to your chest. Now, massive bleeding control from the extremities and the junctional site, these are your main preventable causes of death. Generally speaking, if somebody is shot in the chest or the abdomen, there is not a whole lot we can do in the pre-hospital environment to prevent them from dying if a major structure was hit. In these cases, we have a tool called chest seals. So in the event somebody is shot in the chest, they can have what's called an open pneumothorax. When they get a hole in their chest, that's three fourths the size of the trachea. As they take a deep breath in, the diaphragm goes down and it's gonna cause negative pressure in the chest. Generally speaking, that draws air through our mouths, fills the lungs, the lungs oxygenate our blood, and everything does exactly what it's supposed to do. In the case where we have a hole in the chest, negative pressure fills, and it actually pulls air outside of the lung into your chest cavity and doesn't allow the lungs to fill as efficiently. That's where chest seals come in, and that's called an open pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is just a fancy name for a collapsed lung. So in these cases, we've got these guys here, and this is what's called an occlusive dressing. Very, very sticky. So if somebody is shot in the chest, we can take one of these off, and we just place this right over that wound. Now, this one has two here, so we're going to look for an exit wound as well. So we're going to put one in the front, one in the back. If they have an exit wound, they won't always have an exit wound, just be aware you should have two of these. That's going to prevent the air from entering and it's gonna prevent further badness. Now one risk by covering these up is causing what's called a tension pneumothorax. And I know this is getting kind of in the weeds. It's gonna be something that's hard to identify in the field. So in this case, when I create this, what can happen is it will still be drawing air in. There might be a hole in the lung essentially where air is getting filled up into the chest cavity but it's not able to escape. And what happens is this air outside the lung creates this pressure, this tension, and it's going to slowly compress the heart and the other lung and the other vascular structures here in your mediastinum. And that can kill them relatively quickly. That's why these chest seals have a valve. So you, in theory, it's harder to get a tension pneumothorax because this is actually letting air out of the chest cavity while not letting any air back in. Essentially for these patients, if they start having an increased difficulty breathing, uh, their respiratory uh, rate is getting really high. They're taking shallower breaths. They're complaining of a lot more chest pain. What you can do is you can burp this chest seal because these vents aren't 100%. And you can just take a corner of it, let it go, and relieve some of that tension as it forms. So if you apply one of these, you just have to be aware that you could be causing another problem in their chest, although it's unlikely uh, with the vents. You can improvise chest seals. Uh, people have been taught this for years in Combat Lifesaver although it's a lot harder to do than it looks like on paper. So improvising a chest seal would look like taking like a plastic bag and you tape it on three sides with the third side that's open facing down so it can like let some of that drain. Uh, those are really hard to get to stick. These things are super, super sticky. They'll stick on the patient's chest, but when you're improvising, it just doesn't work that well. If you have a gloved hand, you can just put that over the wound and right there is an improvised chest seal. Just be aware, obviously, once you put your hand there, it's gonna be hard for you to move and do other things. One thing we don't wanna do with chest injuries is pack the wound. As you pack into a chest wound, you're going to collapse the lung, fill that lung cavity with gauze. You're gonna completely diminish their ability to oxygenate and you're not actually going to stop massive bleeding. This is one of those cases, while this is a nice little Band-Aid we can put on there and it might help in some situations, a lot of times they just need a surgeon anything you're doing is just delaying the inevitable slightly. Next body region we're talking about is going to be the abdomen and pelvis. Very similar to the chest in that we can't do a whole lot for these patients. Wound packing is going to be ineffective for them. You don't have enough gauze. You don't have the training uh, to be able to pack into it. We don't even do it on the ambulance or the helicopter. It's just not something we do. 
Uh, so in these cases, what you can do if they have an abdominal wound, you can apply a chest seal, which is just gonna stop blood and grime from getting in there. If it's a superficial cut that's bleeding, you can apply direct pressure down, but ultimately they need a surgeon really quick. All right, so the last body region we're gonna talk about is gunshot wounds to the head. Now it goes without saying that most headshots are going to be fatal for the patient, although, although there's a couple different situations you can intervene on. The first one and the most uh, preventable cause of death I can think of is getting shot you know, in the mouth, in the airway in some way. So this is like a bullet through the cheek on the side, takes the jaw off, something like that. In these cases, the patient will bleed excessively. And if they're on their back, they can literally drown in their own blood and have an airway obstruction that's very, very hard for you to deal with. In these cases, if the patient is conscious, is able to sit up, one thing you can do is you can have them sitting up, leaning forward and allow that blood to drain out of their mouth. The next thing is if they're unresponsive, we wanna put them on their side in what's called the recovery position. And this is laying on their side with the arm above their head, it can support their head. And then it just tilts their mouth down and once again, allows that blood to drain. You can sweep some of that blood out of their mouth with your finger, just know you're not reaching like way back in their throat. We do want to be cautious with the spine in these cases. You know, If we suspect a spinal injury, we want to try to minimize any movement with the neck. However, the presence of an airway obstruction will always trump the potential for a spinal issue. The prevalence of a, sp a spine issue that is made worse with movement is pretty over-exaggerated, and we obviously want to be careful, but this is not a case where you need to have the patient lay down. If that patient is able to sit up, like I just said, we can have them drain uh, some of that blood out this way. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of methods for bleeding control in these cases. If they have like a bullet hole through their cheek, you could apply some gauze, just make sure that you're not causing an airway obstruction and potentially giving them a choking hazard. So the other conceivable injury in the head is going to be a graze wound. So anybody that's seen a wound to the head knows that they bleed a ton. It looks like a murder scene, but they are seldom life-threatening. So if somebody has a graze wound and they are bleeding, we can just take a pressure bandage and then wrap it circumferentially around the head until the bleeding stops. Just because somebody has a massive gunshot wound to the head that enters the cranial vault, so into the brain, does not mean it is automatically fatal, even though that is the usual outcome. So you should always evaluate these patients and if they are breathing, we're not writing them off right there. We are going to provide care for these patients. So I know this is a massive topic, guys, and this video cannot cover every eventuality. I do have videos that I will leave links to down below for you to check out if you wanna dive deeper into things like splinting, the March algorithm, um, bleeding control. But if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I will see you next week. <laughs>